Hey writing superstars, welcome to our Free From Fear live session. I am hoping we are live, so if someone can comment, that would be really, really super because I'm doing it for the first time on my computer, which is very exciting. Um, means I don't need to hold my phone, <laughs> um, but that could mean that I'm just going to talk to myself for an hour, which would be a little bit upsetting for everyone concerned. <laughs> So um, I believe I can see that some people have joined the session. So if you can just write hi, that would be super just so I can check that the comments are working. Cool. All right, the numbers are coming up. Just checking. Yay! Good morning, Misty. Congratulations on your award. Super. We're ready to rock and roll. It's all working. Okay, so if there's anything, I'm very interactive. I can only help as much as um, you guys tell me what you need. Good morning, Catherine. Hi, Karen. Hello, Nina. Perfect. We're working. Uh, so feel free to stop me at any time. Chuck a comment in the comment box. I think I've got all my technology in line so I can see the comments. And um, good morning, Sabine. And um, we can get started. So if you guys are ready, we've got an hour together. I'm going to do my best. There has been so many questions come in. Um, Katie, who helps me manage all my social media, sent me all questions last night. I went, whoo, okay, I don't know how well I'm going to go. So apologies in advance if I don't get to your question, but I will do this again because I do understand, you know, I really appreciate that you have asked the question and really appreciate that you're looking to break through from this fear. So let's get into it. So uh, the first question we have is how do you get past the fear of riding a horse that is known to rear? And and um, that came from Jacinta. So Jacinta, if you're on the call, just um, say hi so I know that I can talk exactly to you. But basically, then I'll just talk in hypothetical land and terms. How do you get past the fear of riding a horse that's known to rear? You need to get clear on what are you afraid of. So rearing in itself, why would you be scared of that? Um, we have trick horses that do it on command. It's actually quite fun. I love a good rear. Um, but of course, there's two concerns. Don't flip back and crush me to death um, or don't land and do something more crazy. Other than that, there's not really a fear to be had around a rear as opposed to jumping out of a plane without a parachute. You get to have a fear of doing that. Um, uh, but obviously in your mind, Morning, everyone. Um, Jacinta, you, in, in your mind, you've decided that a rear could mean death, a rear could mean bad, a rear could mean something else, uh, whatever it is for you. So you first need to get clear on what that is because you're not scared of the rear. You're either scared of what could happen if the rear work goes bad or you're scared of um, what could happen before or after the rear. And it really comes down to, and you're going to hear me talk about this a lot, is gen gen generally, Generally, you'll have to excuse me, my, my gorgeous son kept me up all night. So if I slur my words, I'm not drunk at 7 a.m. in the morning. I'm just a little bit tired. Okay, so, um, yes, you've got to go really, really deep on the fear. And generally, 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 that's not a hard word to say, generally, um, it comes from either a fear of the unknown, of what could happen before or after the rear, or that you don't feel that you have what it takes to handle that. And that's where I usually spend most of my time coaching around um, because the minute we get up, the minute we go and live life, we have uncertainty. We have no idea what day is coming for us. Um, we like to think that we do and we like to plan and we like to organise, um, but we, that living with uncertainty is... Um, something we need to figure out and deal with and manage and also um, backing ourselves, knowing that we have what it takes, knowing that we can handle it is a huge thing also to get through writing and to get through life. So um, if you're on the call, let me know if you need some more clarity around that, but that's the very, very, very short, simple answer to that one. Okay, Jeanette, hello. When I get on a school horse, I'm relatively fearless. Why can't I be the same with my own horse? And thank you for asking the question because I think a lot of people will have that same stuff. And I would be spitballing here, Jeanette, and for most other of you that have that same fear, but I'm guessing you do this cool thing in your head where you believe a school horse is safe, my own horse is not, or some kind of um, version of that in your head. 
So because you have that belief, a school horse is not is safe and my horse is not, that's why getting on a school horse is fine for you and getting on your own horse is not. Uh, when people do actions, it's I, all I need to do is think of the belief that determines that action and therefore I know why the behaviour is or isn't occurring. So it's not about fixing the behaviour, you just need to get on your own horse. It's about going deeper than, than that and fixing the belief that um, my horse is not. And hate to burst your bubble, but a school horse might not be either. <laughs> but like according to your life and according to your rules, you've decided 100% a school horse is safe and my horse is not. And we've got to play with that, manipulate that and change that um, because it's not working for you and it's not serving you. Unless you never had to ride your own horse and you only wanted to ride school horses, I'd say leave it because it's working. But because it's not, we need to go in there and um, change the, the coding of your brain and change how you've made up that rule to a rule that's going to work for you. So trust that makes sense. Let me know if you're on the call. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hey, guys. Let me know if, if this is what you're looking for and if this is helping. Otherwise, I can make it more general or more specific for however you guys make. Okay. Um, Shana, I, I hope I said that correctly. How did you get past the fear that you were doing things wrong and making the horse worse, not better, and that you aren't getting anywhere? Beautiful. So thank you so much for asking that question. Most people are probably resonating with that as well. How do you get past the fear that you're doing things wrong? Ah. <sighs> I was about to say I could write a book. I have written a book on this. <laughs> Humans um, are born completely whole and completely thinking, believing, and feeling that they are awesome. You ask any three-month-old baby, not that you could, but if you did, you'd say, are you awesome? They'd say, yeah, <laughs> I am the most amazing thing on the planet. The world revolves around me and um, everyone adores me. That is how a three-month-old thinks. Somewhere between the ages of two and seven, we figure out this isn't the case. And some, we have significant emotional events happen to us that makes us realize and think and believe, even though it's not real, that we are less than whole and therefore not awesome anymore and not good enough and not lovable and um, not belonging and all these things that we do in our brain. And that's what's going on for you. So you've got this fear that you're not going to do it perfect or correct or right um, and make the horse worse um, and therefore not progress. And because that's what you're scared of, that's what I'm guessing you're doing. <laughs> so because you're scared to get things wrong, you're not trying, um, therefore you're guaranteed not to make progress. Interesting strategy. So what you need to realise again, go back to the baby, is when you learn to walk, um, do, do any children learning to walk going, oh, I'm going to get this walking thing wrong. I'll never figure it out. I'm going to make my legs bad by trying to walk badly and I'm not going to get anywhere and I'm never going to walk. Do they compare themselves? How long did it take you to walk? Really? One month? <laughs> I did it in three weeks. Or do they talk about how long have you, have you been trying for six weeks? You may as well give up now. You'll never walk. <laughs> they don't talk like that. Some children walk really quickly and really early in life. Some people are late. I'm pretty sure not that I'm really up with pediatri pediatrician medicine, but there's a huge range of when a child can walk from like six months to a year and a half. And it can take a, a day and it can take 12 months. And it really does not matter. And believe me, these kids don't care. They walk. They try to walk until they walk. But somewhere again, from that learning strategy to when they become adults, they suddenly develop fear of not getting it right, fear of not being good enough, fear of not progressing, fear of not being able to achieve it, so they don't try. And there's all of you adults out there not walking because you're scared to get it wrong or you're scared it might take a long time or you're scared that you might not be able to. Where if you just tried, it might take a long time and you will fall on your bottom I guarantee a lot and you will, um, you know, uh, some will get it quicker than others and um, if you compare yourself to someone else's journey, you know, you're up for so much heartbreak and so much disappointment um, because every single person is different and the only thing you can compare yourself to is the person you were yesterday and if you're better than the person you were yesterday, you are doing an awesome job. So... 
trust that makes sense if you want to comment on what I've said, but I, I hope that helps, Shana. Okay, Chloe, I get scared to give the leg aids in the canter. How can I overcome it? Cool. So, Chloe, again, you've got to go deep. You're not scared to give the leg aids because if I guaranteed you, if I was a magical being, fairy godmother that could say, I guarantee you, Chloe, when you give the leg aids, your horse will go into the nicest, quietest, softest, slowest, most beautiful canter you will ever experience. You will not feel out of your depth in any way. You will not feel out of control. You will not feel... Um, uh, what else might you feel like unseated you're just going to feel magical wonderful and have the best experience of your life if i could guarantee you that you would be applying those leg aids so fast baby it would not be funny so you're not scared to give the leg aids you're scared to canter and you need to get clear on what are you scared about cantering are you scared you're you're going to be out of control are you scared you're going to be unseated are you scared you're not going to be a hundred percent secure are you scared of what could happen that the horse could bolt off and buck are you scared that you could fall off are you scared that um you're not going to do it well and people are going to laugh at you what are you really scared about and that's what you need to get clear on Cool. Um, Sheridan, how do you overcome the fear of people watching you ride and being afraid they are judging the riding? So again, this book that I've written, because so many people have this fear and I, it, it hurts me. It really hurts me that people are going around um, having not the most amazing, beautiful ex experience in their lives and in their riding because they're wasting energy and time on this. So the first thing is to realise no one is watching you ride because they're all terrified people are watching them ride. So no one's watching anyone because everyone's more scared that people are gonna watch them. That's the first thing. The second thing is, if they're going to watch you ride, that's because you're amazing and they're going, oh my God, look at that person ride, I wish I was them. And if you can't ride, like if I um, went into a piano competition, I can't play piano at all. My husband is the most amazing gifted pianist in the world. Me, I was trying to do that. You know the din 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 I was trying to do that with um, showing Danica and Phil, <laughs> uh, Danica and Tyler, and um, I was hitting those wrong notes, and I was just making a big mess of it. If I went into a piano competition, I guarantee people would not look at me and go, she's the most amazing pianist ever. They would probably go, who does that woman think she is? She's the worst pianist in the world. Um, what an idiot. And if I wanted to enter that piano competition, I don't care what they think because guess what? They're not an expert on my life. And if anyone did come to me and say, you shouldn't have entered that competition, you were really bad, I would just be like, ah! I've been waiting for you all my life. Are you the expert on my life that I need to consult and uh, you know talk with before I make every before I make any new life decision? Please tell me more. What else should I do and what else shouldn't I do? Because clearly you're the expert. Clearly you know everything there is to know about me, everything that has gotten me to this point, every reason of why I've entered the competition. So please tell me more. No one is an expert on your life. No one understands the journey you've been on except for you. No one has a right or a, 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 just no one has a right to care about you because <laughs> you're doing your thing. And the people that do either aren't living their dreams and focusing on their life because I guarantee you I don't notice many people. And if I do, in a good way or a bad way, it always comes from a place of, Hope their journey's going okay. And most, I would really hazard a guess and say most Grand Prix riders watch other riders going on that path and go, good on them for trying and good on them for, you know, getting there. And God, that's, you know, that's the hardest journey that you could ever go on. And you're battling through and you're doing your best. And good on you. Um, it's the riders that don't ride. It's the riders that gave up on their hopes and dreams. It's the riders that um, uh, aren't doing what they want to be doing that decide that they can be experts on other people and have the right to talk, judge or do everything else. So really it's on them and nothing to do with you. And that's how I feel about the world. Um, <laughs> I am living, I'm walking. I've, I've got this little path, which is my life journey. And I'm walking on it. And sometimes I run on it. And sometimes I walk backwards on it. And sometimes I lie down for a sleep. And sometimes I fall. And sometimes I get injured. And sometimes I cry and say it's all too hard and I don't want to do it anymore. And sometimes I laugh. And sometimes I do it wrong. And sometimes I do it right. And really, 
I don't care who's watching, who's in the trees or who's on other paths because they should be focusing on their path and where they're going because that's what I'm doing. So if you can kind of, I'm just trying to give you, download my mindset to hopefully help you Sheridan to realise that um, worrying about other people is just harming you focusing on your journey. And you believe me, to walk along your journey and to get the results that you want in your journey and to be able to do what you want to do on your journey <gasps> takes all your energy and all your focus and all your determination. And when I say energy, all your heart and all your energy. So if you're wasting some of your energy and some of your heart worried about what someone's saying on the sidelines, you're not going to be able to be completely focused on what you're doing. Um, and that's sad and scary because therefore you're not going to be able to walk as quickly and as, quick, as um, effectively on your journey. So trust that helps. Let me know if I've lost anyone. Um, okay. Uh, 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 Deborah, my horse is really lively in winter when she does not get out much and I'm nervous to ride her. Does it make sense to lunge her first or do I ignore my nerves and jump on? That is a question for you, Deborah, and a question for your coach. So some horses need to be lunged, some horses don't. Some horses don't need to be lunged, but we think they do. Um, and that's that's the beauty of this sport. Um, we are working with a living animal. We are working with an animal that can hurt us. They're massive. Um, and we are working with our own doubts and insecurities, and we're working with the reality. So there's some horses that, you know, the top riders on the planet would probably lunge before they got on. Um, and then there's horses that should be lunged before they got on, like my husband, Phil. He'll just be like, oh, I'll get on it. He's like, honey, <laughs> you can't ride. Oh, but I'll get on it. <laughs> and, you know, there's, there's fake brave people that, like, it's not fake bravery. They're really, like, they just don't even know that they need to be brave. They're like, oh, yeah, that'll be fine. Um, so, and I've had riders that, you know, should not be scared of cantering. They've got an amazing seat. The canter's going to be fine. And they're terrified. And I've got people that probably shouldn't be cantering because they might fall off. And they're like, yeah, let's give the canter a roll. So there's mindset and there's logic and there's the riding training, uh, sorry, the horse training part of it and the horse's journey and then we put our journey on top. So the best thing, Deborah, is to speak to your coach and see what the reality is if your horse is too fresh when it comes out of the stables, if it does need a lunge first or if it's if she's happy to ride it and she nothing, the horse doesn't do anything, then, um, then you know it's more a mindset thing that you need to cultivate around confidence in self and leadership in self and belief in self. Trust that helps. How am I going, guys? Is this helping? Let me know. Um, okay, Jenny, how can I get more brave to not be so intimidated in the warm-up ring and be able to warm up my horse how I want? Good question. So first thing is know your arena rules, which is left hand to left hand, and um, look up. Second would be look up because if you're looking down, you will crash into people. So look up and see what people are doing and you do, it is a skill because I always ride a warm up as if I was alone. So I've got my bubble and I've got my brain of, okay, how's my horse feeling and where, what should I be at in which part of my warm up strategy and um, does the horse need to supplement to the left or the right, does he need a leg yield, does he need a shoulder in, does he need to go more forward, does he need to calm down. There's a million questions like that running through my head. Then there's also a whole other brain that's looking up and going, oh, that horse is about to start a leg yield. So even though you were going to turn a circle or canter, transition or do whatever, I have to split blank change my strategy because they're about to crash into me if I did that and ride straight. And then once I pass them, do the 20 metre circle. And sometimes, you know, sometimes I giggle. I've gone around the whole arena ready to do a circle or a transition or something because there's just been people in the way. And that's just, so you never deviate from your warm up strategy. You never deviate if you go the horse needs a leg yield, you, you, you're you looking up and you straight away put it in the leg yield or if you can't because you're about to crash into it, someone, you let it go for two or three strides or however long you have to before you can then do it or the transition or whatever it is for you. So um, the main thing is you said how can I um, be brave to not be intimidated in the warm-up. You have to own that warm-up. You have to be in that bubble firstly um, and then secondly, um, you have to, you have every right. This is going to come down to you going, oh, I don't belong here. I don't have a right to be here. You have every right. Did you pay your entry? Unless you're like, I didn't pay my entry. I'm not registered for competition, but I'm going to like sneak into this warm-up and have some fun. 
then you should probably feel a little intimidated and a little bit um, guilty and a little bit, I shouldn't be here. But if you paid your entry fees, if you are, uh, if you have every right as every other person on this force to be here, and I don't care if there's Olympians in the warm up, and I don't care if there's 50 people in the warm up, and I don't care if they're all better than you according to you, on better horses than you according to you, and um, in their white bandages and you don't have the bandages on, whatever, um, none of that can be in your brain. It has to be, I'm here to do. My best I'm here to show the judge where I'm at with my horse and my training and I'm here to warm up so I can do that to the best of my abilities and that's where your focus should be if your focus is on I shouldn't be in this warm-up and oh, I better not crash into and people like I've, I've had some new people in the arena and I've been riding and they have spent the whole time just running away from me getting out of my way which means they get more in my way and I just I hold it I said guys it's left to left and you have every right to be able to go down the full school and if I'm leg yielding, I have to, you know, not crash into you. Like you have every right to just go straight, just go in the arena where you want to go. And I will adjust it and change, you know, that's normal for me. I don't even have a problem with that. And so I was like, but I'm riding mare and I didn't want to upset you. I'm like, I've probably got 30 mares in my warm up. I wouldn't even know. It doesn't even cross my mind. My, my horse listens to me. I listen to my horse and we've got a job to do. So I trust that helps. Cool, cool, cool. Um, good, 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 good. All right. Then, uh, Jennifer, fear of going fast. So it's like what we've gone through with everyone else. Um, you're not scared of going fast. If I could guarantee you that you would be fine and it would be exhilarating and exciting and the most funnest thing that you've ever done, you'd be happy to do it. What are you afraid of? What will happen if you go fast? Normally it's, out of fear of being out of control. Most dressage riders like to be in control, real control freaks. So you then need to go deeper on that and go, well, when did I learn that I had to be in control? Okay. Um, Lizzie, I fell off a while ago doing sitting trot, no stirrups, and now I'm hesitant to try it again. Any advice? Yeah. So our brains do three things with data. We uh, distort, delete, and generalize. And uh, for example, uh, when we were little, we learnt what a door was and we learnt what a door handle was. And we learnt that to get through a door, you push the door handle down, you push the door in, and you go through the door. And we went through life perfectly fine. And our brain said, all right, we're going to generalise that all doors are the same, which was good because otherwise every single time, even if we're 50, 70, 100 years old, we got to the door, we'd be like, oh, I don't know what to do here. It's a door. I'm terrified. What should I do? What should I do? I have no idea what I should do. We generalise that all doors are the same, therefore we look for a handle and push through. Um, our brain's very useful in that and saves us a lot of time, but if we have a fall, we can generalise. Um, when I do sitting trot without stirrups, I will fall off. Because it happened once, it could happen again. And like I said, that's with a door, once we've gone through a door once, our brain goes, that's how you get through a door. It just, it doesn't need 10 goes at it. It understands that that's what happens. So if you did one time with stirrups and fell off, you have now generalised um, riding without stirrups is dangerous, riding without stirrups is I can fall off, riding without stirrups is blah, blah, blah. Um, and you've only ever done it once, so your brain doesn't even know. So you need to do it again if, it's possible. This is where the logic, the, the riding journey and the horse journey comes into it. If you've got a horse that is going to make you fall off every time you do no stirrups, don't do it because your brain is just going to keep saying, this is what happens when I do this. This is what happens when I do that. So maybe you need to borrow someone else's horse, do a schoolmaster lesson and ride with no stirrups on a horse that is going to be fine to then give your brain, mm, now I'm a 50-50. One time we did something and that worked. One time I did, we did something and this happened. So we need to do it more times so I can generalise. And if you do it 10 times and don't fall off, your brain will generalise. Riding without stirrups is a really great way to improve my seat rather than riding without stirrups is how I fall off. So I trust that. It helps. Christy, how do I shut out the negativity from other riders and old coaches? So we've talked about it a bit. Um, uh, just that little bit of mindset of, you know, <laughs> I'm the expert on my life and you're the expert on your life and I would never dare to presuppose how you should live yours. I'm not even going to say that you should probably live it being a bit nice to other humans. Your choice, your life, all good. Um, and so I always have like a bubble around me. So um, 
people can't penetrate that and can't hurt me. Um, people say nasty things about me, people can judge me, people can blah, 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 um, but it just kind of rebounds off the shield um, and I'm in my little magical fairyland world where I'm a little bit oblivious of what's going on. And I have to do that because um, if I let them in, they would erode my self-confidence, they would erode my leadership, they would erode um, my belief in self, they would, they would hurt me so badly. I would not maybe be the person I need to be to achieve my goals and dreams, which means I wouldn't achieve my goals and dreams, which would mean that I would be very, very sad. So I protect my belief in self and my love of self. And no one talks about this. No one teaches this in school. It's almost if you say, I love myself, that that's a bad thing. And that is horrendous to me. I, I get really upset about that. You you must love yourself. You must back yourself. You must believe in yourself. That is the only thing that you should be doing. Um, so I'm very, very protective to make sure that that can stay because I was not born, well, I was born like that. And then same as you guys, I have significant emotional events make me believe that I was not good enough, not whole, not awesome, not capable, not able to do anything. Um, and then I had to work on rebuilding all of that. And now I'm very like with clarity going, hey, you don't get to, no, 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 you don't get to, you've got your own shit going on and you want to put your shit on me, no, no, no. Um, so I hope that helps, Christy. Um, so, yeah, if you can visualise a shield um, and just realise that no one, so it's an amazing quote, I can't think of the person who said it, um, no one can hurt you without your consent. I think it's Roosevelt, Rosa. The president, dude. Roosevelt? Yeah, Roosevelt. Um, have a look. Google that. But I'm pretty sure it's um, no one can hurt you without their consent. And I read that when I was about mm, 19, 20 years old, and I went, that's that's really interesting. That's cool. I should, I should do some of that. So, okay. Um, the warm-up arena, Philippa. <laughs> so there's no question. It just says the warm-up arena. So hopefully I've covered that. <laughs> Um, Jane, Cantor, just saying the word, oh, just saying the word, I get tense, heart rate rises and the whole oh shit too fast, shakiness starts. How do you master enough calmness to relax into the saddle and just sit? Um, yeah, so I've actually created a training plan around that, Jane, because I do understand, um, absolutely. Um, when we're playing with NLP and, um, when people have phobias, we're like, how bad is the phobia? So if someone says I'm scared, of, I've got a phobia around spiders and I say, spiders. And if they start sweating and I, you know, if I can take their pulse and their heart rates up, I'm like, cool. <laughs> we got some mind stuff going on here. Um, so it sounds like you've got a little bit of something going on, um, which does require a little bit of NLP brain reprogramming to, um, sort that out. So yes. Kyla, do you have a checklist of exercises you do when starting a horse in a dressage program? Not just vague, improved collection, etc. that other trainers say. Oh my God, Kayla, yes. <laughs> I hate that when it's like, what should I do? Um, you should just, you know, they start the German training style. Well, you should just ride in a great rhythm, a nice forward rhythm with calmness and relaxation in a great contact that doesn't change and the horse is just stepping into the bridle, fully engaged with great impulsion, dead straight, um, and then when you lightly apply half halt, it collects. And how would I do that? <laughs> so I don't know if you know, but I do have a Dressage Mastery Academy that explains how to do that. So every month we go through one part of the German training scale, like rhythm, and break down what the F is rhythm, how do you get it, what should you do to get it, what do you do when you lose it, and how do you keep it? And we go through all of that, like what is straightness, and how do you get straightness, and what should you do to keep straightness, and what do you do when you lose straightness? Because I was the same in my dressage journey. I, was like, I knew the vague, I knew what, I, what we were looking to achieve, but how? Do you achieve what you're looking to achieve? And yes, I had a pet peeve. The coach would always say, you know, half halt, half halt. And I'm like, is it too late to tell this person? I have no idea what a half halt is and I have no idea what I should be doing when they're saying that. Um, so yes, you can check out Dressage Mastery. I, uh, I think the website's dressagemastery.com. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. You can check that out. Um, okay, uh, next question. 
Eva, I always feel pressure and tension when people are watching me. So I think we've covered that, Eva. Um, you're going to feel the pressure and tension because you're going to have deep-seated fears of not belonging, not being good enough, not being loved. So you need to um, resolve all of that. You need to heal from all of that and then create a shield and realise that no one cares. <laughs> and if they care, they're not caring enough about themselves. So I trust that answers that. Okay, um, Misty, I think my biggest fear is mounting and dismounting when I'm alone. The riding isn't my fear, it's just the getting on and off that holds me back and riding more. Cool, so you need to, again, get clearer and deeper on that. What are you afraid of from getting on and what are you afraid of from getting off? And is it a strategy thing, like a riding journey thing, a horse thing, where you just need to have someone to hold the horse, you just need to train the horse to stand dead still? Um, or is it the horse is fine, but you've just developed this thing in your head that something could happen? Um, you've got to get that clarity because otherwise you're just going, there's this big thing and, you know, there's solutions to every problem, but you need to understand the problem and what the problem really is, because normally the problem isn't what you say it is to begin with. Okay. Um, cool, 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 cool. I'm just checking the questions. Naomi, sorry if this has been covered. I have my first ever competition tomorrow. How do I deal with the fear of failure? You realise that failure is your stepping stone to success, that failure is your green light to go, that failure is um, how you learn, that failure is to be embraced. Um, my favourite, I, I really love this woman on this planet, um, it's the lady who invented Spanx. So um, the uh, the shapewear stuff and her father said to her every night when she came for dinner what did you fail at today and if she couldn't give him an answer he was like go go fail at something go try and say a german word wrong go and um you know do a maths program and fail and not be able to complete it go and fail um because to him failure was to be celebrated failure was because you're putting yourself out of the comfort zone failure is because you're trying to grow failure is because you're pushing yourself to do something that you might not be able to do and I've really taken on that mindset and I adore failure and I'm trying to teach that to my kids and I'm trying to teach that to all of you because the only way you cannot fail is if you stay in your comfort zone and keep doing the same thing and um, never never push yourself and never grow. And I guarantee you that's just a horrible existence. And maybe not. Don't take my word for it. Don't, don't listen to me. You get to live this life exactly how you choose and exactly how you want. So if you don't want to get out of, out of your comfort zone and you don't want to push and you want the same life that you've always had, rock on. But most of you want more. Most of you want results. Most of you want to step up. Most of you want to um, take it to the next level. But failure will be part of that. So it's dealing with that and um, reconciling that, that um, is everyone's journey. So Naomi, don't waste another second on fear of failure. Just Focus on doing your best. And if that means coming last, it means coming last. No no emotion around that. It just is. And if that means winning, there's no emotion around that either. Like I don't have emotion around outcome. I have emotion around process. Well, actually, I try and remove emotion around, out from process too because that's really bad. Emotion, is, there's a time and place for emotion. Otherwise, it can definitely harm you. Cool, cool, cool. Um, Natalie, did you make it to record any audio book chapters for Fearless Writing? It is in the process. So, yeah, I'm about three quarters of the way through and Kate's doing her techie bit, so it will not be long. Um, Carol, I'm my worst critic. No matter how well I do, I focus on what I did wrong. Despite my experience, I still worry that this will be the time I get seriously hurt as if I'm tempting fate. Any suggestions to change my mindset? Yeah, stop it. <laughs> If it was so easy. Um, there's going to be a pattern and a strategy of why you do that. So me saying stop it and you logically knowing you should stop it isn't going to stop it. Um, so, yeah, you need to do some, some work around um, why you run that strategy. <clears throat> Okay, Nicole, strategies to change thoughts from negative. I can't do this, I'm going to die. Cantering is scary. To positive, I can do this, I'm going to enjoy this. Cantering is fun. It's all right to think at the beginning, but when things get real, it's a little harder. Absolutely. Um, but I challenge the word real. It does, it does your horse literally start bolting on you and literally start rearing on you? Or does it just could it? And is that when things got real? Uh, and like I said, this is not a... Uh, um, 
yeah, you are dealing with a live animal. So I'm always conscious when we're when we have a problem, is it rider mindset or is it horse training? Because there's also an element of horse training. If you have a horse that bucks, you need to train it that it doesn't buck. There's no point going, oh, I'm confident, I'm brave, I've done mindset, I am, I, I can do this. Um, and you get on, you get backed off again. And get on, you get backed off again. Get on, you get backed off again. That's just not going to work. So you need to fix the horse bucking so it doesn't buck anymore. And you need to create a mindset of it's not going to buck anymore and I've got this and I can handle this and I've, I can do whatever needs to be done. And that's when you then go and get the results. Okay, Caroline, brand new 17 hand warm blood backed me off six weeks ago and due to the severity of the injury was originally told 12 weeks. After a recent x-ray review, so been told months and months. Trying to stay positive, um, concern is the longer I'm out of the saddle, the more anxious I will become. So you've just told me one of your rules, Caroline. The longer I'm out of the saddle, the more anxious I will become. Why? According to who? Why would, why? Who said the longer you're out of the saddle is directly correlated to anxiousness. You've decided that. So I think you're saying the rules are if you could got if you could have gotten on the next day, you wouldn't have felt anxious. But because now it's been 12 weeks and now longer, you're going to choose anxiousness. Maybe. I don't know how you live your brain. Um, but you guess what? You drive your own bus, and if your brain has decided that, you can tell your brain that there's a new rule. There's a new rule in town. So <clears throat> Um, there's a lot of things there as well because you've got the medical side of it saying you can or can't do whatever it is. Um, but you need to go deep on um, the anxious is what, about what? Getting hurt again maybe. And if you say, Get, it's, I, I feel anxious about getting hurt again, it's like, yeah, well, why do you feel anxious about that? You got hurt before and you, you were fine. Well, I wasn't fine. I was in the hospital and then, okay. So, but you survived it. Was it, was, you know, what, what, what was this big negative effect? Like sometimes, and again, sometimes people go, well, I was in the hospital. I go, yeah, you mean lying in bed watching TV and getting food delivered to you? Hospital is not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just perception. So to me, <laughs> hospital can sometimes be really great because it is lying in bed watching TV all day and getting food delivered to you and people come with flowers and chocolate and um, you just have to light it. Good or bad thing, I don't have a mindset around it. I'm just saying it could be perceived in either way. Or it's a bad thing because you're stuck in a hospital bed and you can't get to work and you can't get an income and, you know, whatever it is. So there's hugely bad things and hugely good things. Um, but you need to get clear again, Caroline, what are you really afraid of? Are you afraid of the hospital stay? Are you afraid of dying? Are you afraid of... Um, and most people aren't afraid of dying. You might be afraid of the consequence of you dying of who you would leave behind, whatever it is. So you just got to get deep. I could never presuppose how to coach someone hypothetically, but you do need to get clear on what it is. Sarah, how do you get over the fear of cantering? I feel like when I canter, I'll be so tense that I'll bounce instead of going with the horse. Um, I'm a lot more can confident cantering when I have one hand on the saddle and one on the reins, but then I can't steer. Cool, yeah. Um, so again, it's the question of, do you as a rider need to develop a bit more skill? Because I can't determine from that question if you actually um, do need to just canter more and develop more skill um, so you can sit deeper and be able to go with the horse. Or if you're saying on other horses I go with them and I sit perfectly and I have no problems cantering, it's just my young horse, then, yes, it's more a mindset thing and you need to create a new strategy of one, two, three, canter, open hips, sit and go. Um so, yes, again, it's, it's hard because I don't know which, what the problem is. Okay, Catherine, when I jump my horse, I get my anxiety sky... Oh, when I jump my horse, my anxiety skyrockets, I think. What are some good breathing exercises to help with this? I used to be super okay with jumping, but now I'm a mess. Okay, so I'm not a yoga instructor. So I would think just breathing would be good. A good start, just breathing, um, counting your breaths. Um, so I do do a little bit of meditation. So there's, um, you know, your breathing of and one, two, three, four in and hold and then one, two, three, four. Um, but when you're jumping, I do, like you've got to make sure you have enough oxygen going through your, your like if you're holding your breath, that's not good. Um, but again, it's nothing really about your breathing. 
your, your physiology, which is what your body does, is determined by your psychology, which is what's going on in your brain. So you have decided jumping is bad or jumping can hurt or jumping bad things can happen or jumping. Like if you had in your brain, if I downloaded and I said jumping and you went to do, 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 jumping is a good thing. Jumping is easy and fun. Jumping um, is a guaranteed way of staying on the horse. Jumping um, is it's great. Like if all of those things, I guarantee you, your breathing wouldn't change. Do you, do you get anxiety when you sit on the couch? Like, oh my God, what if the couch doesn't support my back? And what if the TV doesn't work? And what if on Survivor, the wrong person gets sent home? Don't. <laughs> yeah. And therefore, because you have no anxiety around the couch or the TV, does your breathing change? No. So if your breathing changes or your physiology changes, like you might, hunch your shoulders and get small um, rather than, you know, or you might pull your shoulders back and bring confidence. Um, that's also going to depend on mindset. But the really cool thing as well is physiology can also lead psychology. So if I say keep, keep being scared or whatever, but bring your shoulders back and put in the leadership pose of I've freaking got this, um, that can also, depending on how bad the mental stuff is, tell your brain, oh, this isn't the situation where I've got to run that strategy. This is a different situation. Because that helps. Thanks, Carol. It was Eleanor Roosevelt. Oh, cool, Eva. I'm glad this is helping. All right. Um, Nicola, I get nervous at bigger competitions and find that I lose confidence in my own ability. I then make a mess of what I'm trying to do because I've allowed my environment to get to me. I compete with quite a few professional event writers, so I get intimidated. Um, yeah, I'm shaking my head, Nicola, because <laughs> in your brain, according to your rules, you compete with a few, a few professional event writers, so I get intimidated. As if, so it's a cause and effect. Because I compete with these writers, I feel intimidated. You may, you could have said to me, like, you can make up any rule you want. Because I compete with international writers, I like chocolate ice cream. Or because I compete with international writers, I like to sing the national anthem backwards. Okay. Whatever rule and whatever decision you want to make, you rock on. It's your life. I'm not judging. But what if you changed it to, I complete with quite a few professional event writers, which means that I have an awesome opportunity to step up and see um, and test myself against the best so I know how far I've got to go. I love competing with professional writers. I love it, love it, love it. And, yes, we're all humans. And, yes, we might choose to feel intimidation or awe or, um, you know, whatever it is. I was talking to an Olympic rider and he was saying the first time he went to a massive competition and there was Isabel and Edward and, and he was like, oh, my God. Um, you know, but doesn't feel that now. And probably the first time we put ourselves into a situation, again, we've got this 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 fear because we are, we are pushing ourselves. So we want to achieve great things in our lives. That means we're going to step out of our comfort zone. So outside of our comfort zone is, you know, where Olympians live, great. Um, and you just got to change the, the rule of, oh, God, they're good, I'm bad, or they know more than me, um, and they might, all of that stuff, but to be a good thing, um, they know more than me, so therefore I can learn. Um, but the same thing with the warm-up. You have every right to be there. You know your rules, and you have every right. Professional riders, in, in, they're the same as you. You know, we were talking about the journey. Um, here's you on your journey, and here's the professional on their, on their journey. They're not better than you. Can you please understand they're not better at you? They're just better at riding than you right now. Why? Because they're more ahead in their journey than you. Now, this was a huge brain thing for me, so I want to share it with you. I, was, I remember listening to something and they said, a brain surgeon is not better than you. And this was at the point where I thought everyone was better than me. And I was like, yes, they are. They're a brain surgeon. And it's like, no. The brain surgeon is not better than you. They're just better at brain surgery than you. And I was like, yeah, -huh. <laughs> they are better at brain surgery than me. And that's okay. <laughs> but they're not a better human than me. They're not a better person than me. And if we were to go head to head, there would be something that I would be better at than the brain surgeon. And I was like, well, that's quite correct. So you need to go with an international rider or an Olympic rider. Yes, they're better at riding than you, but they're not 
better than you. They're just better at the writing and they're better at the writing because they've done it more, because they've they've gone further on their, their journey that you're going on. And they're normally really great, nice people and you can go talk to them and ask them for help. So I don't, does that help, Nicola? I'd love to know if that helped. Um, Kerry, I have a six-year-old who was a rescue. I worry about what could happen. I'm waiting, it's, uh, expecting something even though my instructor has written and I've written all is good. My mind still wanders. How do I get, get rid of those pesky thoughts? Um, so you have to first ask yourself, what is the purpose of those thoughts? Because you drive your own bus and you have decided that you should think those things. Um, so what do you get from that? What is your reward from that? And then you've got to go deeper on that and deeper on that. There's a reason humans do all strategies and um, it's not okay to just try and change the strategy. You need to change the root cause. Sana, my dear Natasha, whenever I spend a period not riding, I feel afraid. I imagine and believe I can't ride well, may fall and lose confidence. I start feeling pain in my stomach as if I was going to do something dangerous. I don't know how to solve this. So the first thing to understand is there's um, normally no difference between fear and excitement in your stomach. It feels the same. Um, so I would think you're just excited about going riding again. And secondly, um, you've got to go deep on how did you learn that? Because you weren't born feeling and thinking riding was dangerous and you could fall off and die. That, that has been something you created based on something you experienced, something you saw, something you chose to take on as reality for you. So you've got to go deep on what that is and why you learned that and unlearn that. Cindy, I'm fearful when doing rising trot of the loss of control in seats um, and then hold on with my inner thighs. I'm loving everything else about dressage except for rising trot. would rather do sitting trot. Yeah, so that's a control thing, Cindy, and you perceive when you're in rising trot <clears throat> that you don't have that connection with the horse's back, so you're not going to be able to feel what the horse is going to be doing and therefore you're a little out of the comfort zone. Um, so the, <clears throat> the training part of it is just go rising trot, two steps, sitting trot, then rising trot, three steps, sitting trot, then rising trot, four steps, sitting trot. That's the surface level fixing. And the deep level fixing is you have to get very, very clear on um, why you fear being out of control. If you want to go deep. Cool, cool, cool. Um, all right. I can do one more question. I'm just trying to think. If anyone has a question on the call, let me know. And I can... Oh, I haven't scrolled down. Sorry, guys. Um, Nicola, sorry, guys. I don't know. Me and technology. Why wouldn't it just come up? All right. Nicola, how can I remember to put my shield up when I'm riding at big comps or in front of professionals? I think the shield idea would help me, but when the pressure is on, I need to remember to use it. Um, it's just there. It's just there. It's training. It's um, just making sure that you are <coughs> committed. So for me, my shield's always there. Um, but it wasn't. So how did I do it? It was just when I felt, you know, that, I don't belong here. I shouldn't be here. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That I went, hang on, shield up. Yes, I do. If that helps. Um, Natalie, can you explain big picture and small picture persons? Talked about it in the Phyllis audio book when speaking about the vision. Yes. So big picture people are, um, if you were going to sail from the North Pole to the South Pole, you just want to, you want to see the map of the world and you want to see the South Pole and the North Pole and you want to see the entire world and where you have to go. Small picture people go, where are we heading? Down south. Cool. Show me a map of um, Finland and we'll just work out how to get through Finland heading down and then when we get the next, and please excuse me, sorry, Finland, I don't know if you're close to not, you're kind of close, but it's probably Iceland or I'm not so up with the geography. But anyway, you want to be at one of those top countries up there and you'll just figure out how to get through that country and then when you've gotten through that, you'll figure out the next step, then you'll figure out the next step. So when you're doing visions and goals, people are like, I couldn't possibly think of where I'd want to be in 50 years. That's ridiculous. I'm much happier to set a weekly goal. Where should I be next week? And the big picture people are going, oh, I want to be here in 50 years and I want this and I want that. And then it's like, cool, what, do you, what should you do next week? Oh, I don't know because I need to have this in 50 years. So you need to be able to do both. You need to be able to see the big picture and the big broad scope of where you want to be. 
and let's say if you're setting your vision for the fearless writing, this big, rich expression of um, how your writing could be if you're completely confident and completely fear-free. And then not getting overwhelmed by that because that's a really big goal. And if you're not getting on your horse because you're scared, you're not going to be motivated by that goal. So then it's like, what's the very next step, which would be just getting on. So I hope that helps. Um, okay. Um, Alyssa, I get nervous riding horses I don't know. I feel like I'm sitting on some strange planet and don't know what I'm doing. I can never ride as well as I can on a horse I know. Well, part of that's normal because um, all horses have kind of a different language and you've got to get to know each other and get to learn how to speak to each other. Um, but if you have that rule like we had at the earlier time where it's like this horse is fine and this horse isn't. Um, so if you're going, I've, if I'm riding a horse, I don't know, it could kill me. If that's then limiting how you ride it and you don't put your legs on as much as you should or you don't ask for as much as you should, um, you need to reconcile what you think riding horses I don't know means to you. Isabel, my stallion is great to ride where he lives, but when we go somewhere else, he doesn't listen to me, especially if there's nares there. I get scared because I feel that and I can't control him. What can I do? So, Isabel, you need to have a trainer that can help you um, and you've got to make sure that he listens to you. So my stallions, I can have five mares all around me. doesn't matter. Um, and that is, especially on young stallions, something you need to teach them. So we're very, very clear when the saddle's on, you're not a stallion. Um, when we take you to the breeding shed, you are a stallion. My stallion, my young stallion rears at the breeding shed. He um, screams like he's neighing at the breeding shed. He is, you know, passaging and he's just like, ah, which he has to be because we need to get him excited. We need to get a collection out of him. Um, but if I had a saddle on his back and I'm at a dressage competition and he's rearing and he's screaming, absolutely not. He is not allowed to talk. He is not allowed to open, you know, to... to He's not allowed to be a stallion. Um, so it's really important that you teach them where they can express that part of themselves and where they have to not express that part of themselves. And that, I think, does also require a trainer um, because, to me, this is logical. You're scared because you can feel he's not listening to you. You should be scared. <laughs> like a stallion that's going to go jump a mare at a comp it is not the nicest thing. Okay. Um... Sonia, my new horse is so good but young and green. He looks to me and has a really honest nature. I bought him as a lesson. Yes, you have generalised some of the results. Do I just say new horse, clean slate? Absolutely, Sonia. So I have a rule where I get on a horse, there's no past and there's no future. And even um, the stride before has no impact on the stride. The next stride, only the only thing I take from the last stride is any learnings. So if a horse bucked, 10 minutes ago, I'm not still sitting there going, oh, he's back to the back again, oh, my God, oh, my God. I'm just like, watch him. He's, he's got something there. Um, but I'm not worried if, if he does it. But I still need to be aware of it. So, um, yes, every horse deserves, when you put that foot in your stirrup, that you have full respect, full um, uh, generosity. Um, what else do you need as a mindset? Love, generosity, um, curiosity of how this horse works and what it likes to do and what it doesn't like to do, um, and excitement and um, fun rather than trepidation, um, bullshit from your old horses, um, fear, um, anxiousness, um, defensiveness. Like you need to have an openness and a generosity to your riding rather than a closeness and, a, and yeah, riding defensively. Um, just that helps. Um, Kim, I want to ride out in the open, but I get nervous. I'll do only for a few minutes. Please help. Again, Kim, you're not scared of riding out in the open. You're scared of what could happen if you ride out in the open, and I don't know what that is. So you need to get really deep on um, what are you really scared of and why you're really scared of that because it's probably going to be around the loss of control and why you're scared of being out of control. Cool. Glad this is helping. Um, Natalie, I kind of feel the program helps me not only with my riding fears but with fear in general. Can the techniques be applied to any fear? Thank you for this amazing program. Can't wait for the book to arrive in Germany. <laughs> Fabulous, Natalie. So can the techniques be applied to any fear? Absolutely. So um, every time I, I, and especially with fear, 
um, fear is not a static thing. It's not like I'm scared to canter. Now I've overcome that fear of canter. I will never be scared of cantering again. If you canter, like you might be fine for three years and then you might fall off again and canter or something might happen and um, you might see someone get hurt and then all of a sudden you, your brain will decide that there's fear there again. So that's why I'm not about, in, in my fearless program, I don't teach you how to overcome fear of canter. I fear, I teach you how to control your own brain. I teach you how to recode things that could have happened or decisions that you may have made or learnings that you may have decided you learned that aren't serving you to turn them into things that can serve you so you can achieve your goals and dreams. Now, that has obviously a huge broader application to your life. And if you know anything about me, I'm really obsessed with people not only having a great writing experience, but a great life experience. So some people might not apply for a job because they're scared that they won't get it or like a promotion. But what if you then applied these fear techniques and these ideas of backing yourself and feeling self-love and feeling confidence and feeling self-belief um, and that job, that promotion is mine and I'm going after that. And if I fail and I don't get it, no worries because I've just learned another strategy and learned another way of how not to do something and I'll be better at it next time. Obviously, there's a huge application to this in your competition as well. And some people not only compete in writing but compete in other competitions in their lives. It's a great great thing to teach your children because obviously they need to navigate life and they will fear feel fear in their lives um, and that's what people people also come to me for the course going so will you teach me will you eliminate my fear absolutely not that would not be ethical of me fear is a good thing fear tells you you're out of comfort you're out of your comfort zone fear is growth fear is um, stepping up so I will not eliminate that for you but I will teach you how to manage it. I will teach you how to work with it. And I will teach you how to love it so you can go about your life, go about your writing and achieve what you want to achieve rather than um, staying small, staying hidden and not achieving what you want to achieve. So, um, yeah, I'm really, really passionate about helping writers with that. So, um, uh, yes. We've only got four minutes. So I've just shared um, uh, the website, fearlesswritingsuccess.com. So I do have a 12-month fearless program that I did put in everything I know about overcoming fear, not only in your writing, and I do know about fear in writing. I have been bucked off and broken a bone in my back. I have um, definitely had to use all of these techniques and more into getting back on to the horse that hurt me, as well as getting on young horses, getting on stallions, getting on horses that people don't want to ride, all that kind of stuff. But as um, Natalie brought up, I probably use the techniques that I teach you in this course more day to day in my work, in my dealings with my children, in my um, business in my um, other parts of my life that I feel fear in. So if you want to step up and if you want to learn how to be out of your comfort zone and not totally freak out, and if you want to enjoy your writing, I would love for you to check out the Fearless Writing Program. Now, it's only a dollar for the first month's trial. So I've made it that way, so it's a no-brainer. And we are removing that dollar trial at the end of the month. So there's only three or four days left to claim your week's trial for a dollar. And I would encourage every single one of you to just try it. So I'm not going to be offended at all. If you try it, you do the first month and you go, it's not for me. Absolutely cancel. Nothing else will be, nothing will be charged. Nothing else will happen. You've spent a dollar. It wasn't for you. No worries. No problems at all. I won't be offended. But if it is the program for you and if it is the step you need that's going to mean that in 2018 you get the results you want to have and that you're going to finally be able to step up and finally be able to face these, these fears and these demons that have kept you small and kept you at a certain level, I would love, love, love for you to, to follow with that program. So it's a dollar for the first month and then a $49 investment for the remaining 11 months. You can fast track. We have plenty of people that fast track through the course quite quickly. Even they do one a week. So they finish the course in three months, in 12 weeks. Um, so it's, it's whatever, how fast or how slow you want to go through the program. It will be challenging. There will be moments. I, I have to like do a disclaimer. You might cry. 
um, people that have gone through the program, I don't know if you want to comment. <laughs> um, but it is, like I said, I don't just surface coach. I don't just say, oh, okay, you've got a fear of cantering. Let's just canter. That's not useful for you. I help you peel back all the layers of the onion, so to speak, so you can see the, the vulnerable core of what it is that you're terrified about and what you've been hiding and what you've been protecting and what you've been hoping no one will find out. Looking at that, exploring that, facing that, and then building back the layers of the onion to be a whole love, belief, confident leader to ride your horse and to go conquer, conquer the world and go and achieve your goals and dreams. So that's what the program is designed to do. And I'm very, very proud to say there's been thousands of people going through it that have got amazing results. They're cantering with a big smile on their face. They're competing. They're um, changing their lives. They're getting job promotions. They're doing all these amazing things because they've started to believe in themselves. They've backed themselves and they've brought that confidence. So it is a gift that you can only give to yourself and I can fight for you and push for you and say, come on, come on, come on. But at the end of the day, it is your choice and your decision. And I'd just love for you to, to trial that first month for a dollar. So head over to fearlesswritingsuccess.com and um, just click the join us button and it will take you to credit card information. Just fill that out. Your credit card will charge the dollar and you've got 30 days to see if it's right for you. If it's not, no worries. Just email us. Say it's not for me. No offense will be taken. Good on you for seeing if it was maybe right for you. And um, you'll cancel, you'll be cancelled, no other charges. And if you go, oh my God, this is amazing, I want to fast track or I want to just stay with it, there's nothing you need to do. Just after 30 days, your credit card will get a $49 investment taken out of it and you'll be in the course. So I trust that has been a really useful time that you've spent with me. I have had an amazing hour. Thank you for all your amazing questions. And I really, really appreciate you guys playing full out. Um, thank you. Thank you for spending an hour with me. And like I said, I really just encourage all of you, just check the course out. I just want you to check it out and do month one. If it's not right for you, it's all good. But if it is right for you, it is going to be something that you're going to be so grateful that you did. And um, it is going to change your life. So I'll see you guys very, very soon. Thanks for the hour and um, talk soon. Bye.